Stuart, welcome to the podcast. It's really nice to meet you. Well, thank you for having me, Alex. I appreciate your time and everything you're doing. Ah, likewise. I think um, it was probably two or three months ago that I first got introduced to you. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the author of The Grief Trip, which I've uh, read and, and really enjoyed. And um, that's kind of why we've, we've met today, obviously. Um, yes. to kind of share your message, your experience and your journey thus far. Um, so for people that aren't yet familiar with you and your story, are you happy just to kind of maybe introduce yourself and, and lay the foundations of what we'll talk about today? Sure, sure thing. So um, I am just a, uh, or was just a normal average everyday person, you know, with a, a wife and a couple great kids and a dog and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, a bomb went off in our life. My, my son ended his life, died by suicide. And at the time, you know, I didn't, didn't really know what to do. I tried to be a strong father, a strong husband, you know, for my family. And I came across uh, a blog or an article, something. I don't remember what it was. I should get, find it and give him credit. But I read something that said that uh, uh, LSD and, and magic mushrooms can put a person into a dreamlike state. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll try that. And I was somebody who had never tried a single drug my entire life. My, my dad was DEA and I just was, I was against drugs, never tried anything, not even pot, not even marijuana, right? Nothing. I mean, alcohol, caffeine, sugar, you know, I did all the acceptable ones, you know, <laughs> to excess, but um, none of the illegal ones. And so I decided to do this to try to to be with Ian, to see if I could be with him in my dreams, which was not the real thing, but, you know, better than nothing, because suffering such a, a tragic, unexpected loss um, is just, uh, people say to me, uh, I can't imagine what you're going through. And, and it sounds, it sounds, I don't know, arrogant or something, but I'm like, yeah, you can't, because I, I couldn't imagine it either. It's just, it's that horrible. You know, there's no movie or book or anything that can really express how horrible it is to, to lose a child period and lose a child to suicide. So um, that's, that's really what it was, you know? And so I ended up going down the proverbial rabbit hole. And as a result, you know, I was doing stand up comedy at the time. I, I pivoted that to a show called the stoned ape show and ended up writing this book, the grief trip. And I will, I will do, a short version or a full version of the Stone Dave show for any organization that wants to have somebody come in and talk about suicide and psychedelics. It's not like they're all knocking my door down because, you know, usually they both have stigma, right? Nobody wants to talk about death. Nobody wants to talk about suicide and nobody wants to talk about psychedelics. So that's why I'm grateful for people like you that are willing to, you know, put these kind of things out there. Yeah, I think, um, I guess for so many reasons, I think, you know, so many of us are not equipped to talk about these things, you know, and we do push them down. Um, Katie and I, my wife, she had a miscarriage early on in her first pregnancy. Uh, and, you know, I want to say things like, I can't imagine what it means to you when I read your book and thinking about what I was going to say to you. But, and then I think back to that experience and I think some of the things that are said meant well, but actually at the same time often make things worse as well and it's a really just tricky situation for everyone and at least from our experience it was not being able to sit in that discomfort and just not say anything ultimately that yeah. may, have been, may have been actually the best thing that anyone could have could have done um so yeah i'm i like to encourage us to to get vulnerable and kind of sit in these kind of topics ultimately yeah i'm, I'm with you 100 percent. I'm, I'm in a few groups for people who have lost children to suicide. And, and one of the, I get the question, all the, we get the question, people come out and say, you know, my family just wants me to move on. You know, they, they want me to say, you know, get over it. It's been six months, it's been a year. And, you know, what am I supposed to do? And I think the, the prevailing great advice is, you know, just be with your pain in your own way, in your own timeline, because you're never going to get over it. You're never going to move on, you know? And so it's, it's, uh, a lot of us just need to hear that and have people wise enough like you to say, hey, you know, and you you went through that. A miscarriage is, is, is big and impactful and horrible, right? Um, so you understand, you are somebody who can come to me and say, you know, I, I do understand, you know, a bit of what we were going through. So I'm sorry for that, for, for you and your wife. That's 
that's a tough one. Um, but yeah, I think letting people be in their pain, let them deal with their pain in their own time, I think is kind of the central thing that I've learned mm. here on my journey. I've had therapists tell me there's no moving on. There's only moving forward. The title of the book is healing with grief, you know, the subtitle, because, you know, for anybody out there who loves somebody who lost a child, just know they're never going to get over it. They're never going to move on. This is their new life. Their life changed right in that moment. And this is their life for the rest of their lives. All you can do is just hold space with them and be with them. And, you know, if you can support them in any way, but you don't, there's nothing you can do. So don't feel obligated to try to do something. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that really resonated with me in your book was what you actually already mentioned around deciding that you have to play this very strong dad figure and kind of, you know, mm -hmm. hold it together essentially for the family. And I know you mentioned the book that um, your wife may say that that, that didn't happen as much as it, it could have kind of thing. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really curious through your kind of journey with, with psychedelics and just essentially that journey, do you feel that, or I guess, how did that impact kind of your, your journey moving forward? The, the, playing the role of the, the strong husband. Yeah. I think it, uh, you know, luckily I didn't shut down completely. Okay. I've always been very open. Um, I think, I think when, when one does comedy, you, I started to take on the ability to just say whatever comes to my mind, you know? And so I don't, I don't really have, and I will say the wrong thing sometimes, you know, sometimes I will hurt feelings. And so I was good at, at, discussing my, my feelings and my thoughts and those kind of things. And, but I think that I just had this, um, buffer. I think all it did was give me a buffer or a shield or something against actually getting vulnerable and actually digging down in, in the muck because I felt like, like I could fall apart. And I felt like if I fell apart, then, then I wouldn't really be here for my family. And the weird thing that happens with grief, especially with a couple, a couple that loses a child, um, and you and know, you and your wife may have, may have gone through this also, especially in the, the days close, closer to the loss is that you, you kind of, you kind of balance each other. Right. So I'll, I'll have a day where I am feeling really down and somehow she senses that and, and she'll come out of her deep, deep depression and kind of be there for me. So we'll go back and forth okay. with that. Um, and I'll, and I'll tell you right now, uh, you know, as, as sad as I am and as sad as I've been and the depressions and the darkness, I honestly feel like it can't even compare to what my wife is, is going through. I think for a mom, you know, to, to lose a child, there's a connection there that us dads can't, can't ever understand. And so I won't ever say she came out of her depression or sadness and was there for me in some kind of big strong way because she was so deep it is five five almost six years later still very deep in her grief so but but she would you know the, the two of us would wax and wane between being okay and not being okay but i feel like i always kind of held up a little bit of a barrier just to make sure that i didn't you know go over the deep end and not be here for the family sure and um in regards to, I guess, the psychedelic side of things, I mean, I remember in your book, you kind of commented on how you were, you were having quite vivid dreams anyway. So the idea of psychedelics taking you to this dreamlike space was, was kind of one of those appealing things for you. Mm -hmm. um, so how did that kind of journey start for you? Did you do much kind of preparation work before your first ceremony? And, and what did that yes. look like? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I'm very open with with psychedelics and open to talking to anybody, you know, and I hear a lot of stories. Well, cause my podcast, the stone day reports, I talk to people who have been through things and, but I'll have just regular people come up to me like happened this weekend. My wife and I were out to lunch and I had a psychedelic conference shirt on that I had attended. Um, and this kid just starts talking to me. He's like, Oh yeah, you know, I, I did mushrooms, but I was at a party and you know, I, I think it gave me anxiety and, you know, all this stuff. And, I don't want to judge anybody, but it's, I just sat there and I just felt bad for the kid, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's not the way you do, do this stuff. You know what I mean? It's not a party drug, you know? And so, I mean, LSD, you know, P 
people have a great time and they get creative and, you know, they take their clothes off and jump in the pools. You know what I mean? And so there's, there's lots of fun to be had. I don't want to be yuck anybody's yum, but when it comes to um, going on this journey, like you mentioned, yeah, there's a lot of research, you know, there's contraindications. So there are people have conditions that should not ever do a psychedelic. Um, people take uh, medicines that, you know, pharmaceuticals that are contraindicated. And so they should never do certain psychedelics with those. So there's, there's a lot of research around making sure that you're safe, making sure that your substances have been tested, making sure you've built your set and setting. Your set is your mindset that you're ready. It doesn't mean you're happy, right? Because am I ever going to be fully happy again? No, right? And so it doesn't mean you go into a journey thinking, oh, I'm happy and this is going to be a great psychedelic fun and I'm going to play psychedelic music and everything's great, right? It's, it's just about am I prepared to do this? Even though as soon as you take the medicine, suddenly you feel totally unprepared. You know, you're just like, okay, what have I done? You know, what's going to, I broke my brain. This isn't going to go well. You know, that, you know, you panic. I, you know, I went through that. And so, but the mindset just means I have prepared. And then the setting is making sure you've got a nice place to do this comfortable, clean, warm, um, warm in feeling, not in temperature, you know, just a, a nice, comfortable place to be. Mm. And when you have all that, that's pretty much the research. So yeah, I did, a, I did a lot of research, especially for a guy who was against drugs, right? you know, and, and a guy who was, who felt drugs were bad. I mean, I grew up in the era of LSD, you know, I grew up in the seventies and eighties back then the drugs were pills and Coke, you know, and so in, in pot, and I would hear people talking about it and, never really knew, but then, then the parents would always say, yeah, the drugs are bad, but what's really bad is LSD because it's going to break your brain and you're going to have flashbacks and you're getting addicted, you're going to die. And so, you know, it's going into that with some of that fear, but the mindset part of it is just doing the research, testing the substances and really understanding the amazing and beneficial power that these, these psychedelics have for people. Mm. And I think for you, I think from memory, you mentioned the book, how you kind of part of that research was around obviously dose as well. Um, yes. So yeah, kind of a, a key variable within the, <laughs> within the experience. Yeah. Yeah. Substance, dose, set, setting. Those are probably, you know, the key areas with the subsets being tested. Um, make sure that you've got uh, somebody around. Don't, you know, don't run off and do this by yourself. Um because it's the thing, you know, people say, they mention bad trips or say, oh, I have a bad trip or this is really scary or you see people freaking out. And it's uh, very rare, first of all. And but second of all, it's it's kind of make believe. You're not really freaking out. You're freaking out because you think you're freaking out. Right. <laughs> and so you need somebody just to tell you hey, you're on drugs. You're OK. You know, and then at that point, it's just like, oh, yeah, I'm on drugs. I'm, I'm OK. You know, that, this isn't really real. I mean, that's a whole different topic is, is what we see really real, but um, yeah, have somebody around test your substances, first aid kits, you know what I mean? Or whatever, just make sure everything's nice and safe and comfortable. And so there's a, there's a lot around that, but doing the right dosage is, uh, is key that people's egos get in play. In fact, they call a large dose of mushrooms, um, a heroic dose which just drags your ego right into it. And it should, there should not be an ego play, right? There should be no badge. It's not the Boy Scouts where you take a giant dose and you put a badge on your Facebook page and you look how good I am. I took a huge dose. <laughs> Sometimes the, the smaller, I've had huge insight with very small doses. So I would just say to people, don't let your ego get in the way of, of making your dosage decision. You know, make that based on your, your heart and your mind and the research that you've done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think I can um I can kind of testify to that as well. You get some some interesting experiences just with the different doses. And I think I think they all have their merits ultimately. But in regard yeah. in regards to I guess your journey, like what uh, how do you feel it, it sort of sculpted sort of the journey from that first experience onwards? Because obviously in your book you you've tried more than one psychedelic as well, for example. So how did that first mushroom experience kind of guide the rest of my journeys. Yeah. And how, do, how has your psychedelic use, um, yeah, sort of aided you in your journey? My grief journey. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. 
because, you know, people, I go through all this, you know, and I explain all the, the benefits. So I was kind of, and sometimes I can, I can exaggerate this because of the comedian part of me, right? But I was, I was kind of a conservative, judgmental, curmudgeon -y type of dude, right? And then I went, then Ian died and I started taking all these medicines and going down these journeys and suddenly started wearing yoga pants and, and white baggy shirts and, you know, mala beads and meditating and grew my hair out, which I've since cut, by the way, but it's, you know, all this stuff. And then people were literally like, okay, so, you know, it turned you into a hippie, you know what I mean? But has it really helped you at all with, with the grief? And I think that that's, that's a really great question and a very important question. And the irony of it is kind of analogous to what psychedelics are like. So people will get the advice when you go on a psychedelic journey, especially if you do something like an ayahuasca ceremony, is to go into it with an intention. And in the early days, I would try, and it's kind of a cosmic joke, right? So you go into um, a ceremony or a solo trip and you say, okay, my intention is to heal with my grief, to forgive myself, to, uh, to be with Ian, you know, whatever it is. And in the medicines, they just laugh and say, okay, you know, you think that's what you want, but that's, you know, that's not where we're going today. But when you look back at it, you find out that probably it's just like psychotherapy. Anybody out there who's ever been to psychotherapy, right? You, you, and I have been years of psychotherapy for unrelated stuff when I was younger. Uh, very helpful. And I recommend it for everybody. I don't, I try not to shit on people, right? But I think everybody should go to psychotherapy and everybody should do a hermitage meditation retreat. But beside that, you go to a psychotherapist and you sit in his or her office and they say, okay, what, what do you want to work on? And you say, I want to work on addiction or I want to work on, you know, I eat too much or I, wanna, I have an anger problem or whatever it is. And you know, in the back of their minds, they're thinking, yeah, that's not the problem. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm going to, we're going to talk. So let's start with this thing you call addiction or this anger problem, but that's not the problem. And eventually you get to the underlying trauma, right? As to what is under all of this and what's, you know, from abuse and, and divorce, broken home. I mean, you know, every, there's so many traumas. There's a billion of them, right? And so psychedelics do the same kind of thing as you can go into it and say, okay, I, I want to work with my grief and psychedelics are like, yeah, but let's, let's look at these other things first. And just, just like psychotherapy, you know, in fact, my therapist, I, I currently have a therapist and she came to me and was like, well, if you have all this insight from these medicines, why are you talking to me? You know, and it's true. I can get one or two years worth of insight of like psychoanalysis insight from one trip, but therapists also have their place. They're, they're trained, they understand things and they can kind of help you get through some of the stuff that you learned. But so that's a very long way to answer your, your question is, um, it has helped me to heal this broken human being, right? I was broken from childhood, which I didn't even realize. I thought, you know, when my parents got divorced, I was like, this is cool. You know I mean? I get to keep all my dad's stuff, you know, and, I, and I'll see, and I'll see him whenever. And I never, ever thought there was anything that came out of that, but it turns out there's a lot of crap that, you know, got dumped on me from that and all their fighting and all this other stuff. And so what happens is just like psychotherapy, the, the medicine, psychedelics peel off layers of the onion. And I just started to heal as a human being. And I started to find my path in life. And I started to understand myself better. And when I did all those things, everything started coming together better. You know what I mean? I started losing weight and I started being connecting better with other human beings and better with nature and just so many things were good, you know, and that's, and I started to feel happy, which is a strange way to feel after this, right? I mean, this is like, you know, the dark night of the soul, you know, or the cave in a hero's journey or whatever it is. It's so freaking dark and horrible and sad and just brutally torturous, right? And so to think that there could ever be a moment of happiness um, is unfathomable until I started doing all this other work on myself that I didn't even intend to do 
just like with my psychoanalysis way back in the day, I didn't intend to work all that stuff he brought out of me. But when he did, my life got markedly better. And the same thing happened, you know, with, with these medicines is that it brought stuff out. It helped me heal. I, you know, I felt, I didn't realize that I myself felt suicidal and um, mushrooms brought that out, uh, you know, during a mushroom. I don't want to go into a, a trip report because those are like hearing somebody's dream, right? It's like, oh, could you just stop? But, you know, during the, during the experience, I felt like the earth was electrocuting me. And I kept wondering, I was like, why is the earth trying to get rid of me like a cockroach? And I realized that, you know, that's how I felt is that I didn't belong here. And I, I didn't, you know, I needed to be gone. I needed to be dead. And that really opened up my eyes. And it's kind of like the first step to anything is admitting you have a problem. Well, that, that trip more than admitted that I had a, a concern or a problem. It just saying it out loud was like, wow, I didn't even know I felt like that. You know, ayahuasca taught me that I felt uh, powerless, you know, to change my own life, which I never understood. And I can go to psychotherapy now. I can look back at my time with my therapist and go, oh, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that I learned from the divorce is, is life goes along and then boom, everything is crap. And I have no power over that. Right. You know, suddenly my dad is gone and my mom's really unhappy and there's like, you know, unpleasantness is the only way I'll put it here in public going on in the house. And, um, you know, you just, as a kid, you're like, oh, it's all my fault, you know, and that's what's going on. And so helpless and, and ayahuasca, la madre, the spirit, they call the spirit of, of ayahuasca, la madre, the mother, um, came in to me and, and said, yeah, um, you need to get rid of your sense of powerlessness. You know what I mean? Your, your feeling of, of not being able to help yourself. And in one ceremony, blam, she got rid of that for me. I walked out of the ceremony. And at the time, I didn't know exactly what she had taught me. It was just an amazing um, visual experience with her. That, you know, she built this thing for me and said, get rid of this. And I got rid of it and I purged, which if you don't know about ayahuasca is, you know, when you throw up, everybody's like, oh, you're going to throw up. You know, it's a, it's a real spiritual part of the whole thing. You know, it's not, you don't just throw up. You know what I mean? It's not like eating bad meat. It, it's about... Um, getting rid of something spiritually. And so I got rid of this powerlessness and it took me a couple of days to realize that's what it was. Um, and on the positive side, you know, the mushrooms help connect me to other people. Um, the uh, 5-MeO-DMT, which, you know, just throw out a PSA there, stay away from the toads, leave the toads alone, please. You know what I mean? They're, they're beautiful, wonderful creatures here in our desert. Don't, don't, synthetic is fine, fine synthetic. But um, that, that showed me the, the, the grand consciousness that connected me with, with my soul, with other souls. Is that real? I don't know. It seems real to me. And when I meditate now, I connect with it in a way that I never did before. <laughs> and so all that stuff just, I think, combined to make me healthier. My mental health got better. And it built a better fortitude, a better base foundation for me. And as a result, yes, I still, I still, I'm still grieving. You know, the other day I went and got a, a burrito from this place nearby. And, and it's a place that Ian and I used to go and have breakfast together. And I just found myself tearing up, you know, I mean, out of nowhere. I'm just like, Psh. and so there's, there's a deep, deep sadness. that's always going to be there. So I don't want to make it sound like I ate a bag of mushrooms and everything got better. And that's the secret to getting over this. So you'll never get over it. But I think if, if anybody out there grieving can help through therapy, so here, here's a line I like. I don't think it made it into the book. And I got this from Ram Das, but I think he got it from probably somebody in Japan. Because I think, I think the saying is for Mount Fuji, but he said, um, a mountain has one peak, but many paths up it. And so I, I thoroughly believe I took psychedelics. I meditate. Um, somebody else may jog or knit or do yoga or psychotherapy or group therapy or whatever, right? We all have our own different Jesus, whatever anybody has out there, go, go do your path and find your path to building a, a foundation from which you can find some happiness and some pleasure in life. That doesn't mean the sadness is going away. And that doesn't mean you're doing a disservice to the person that you lost. Cause that's the big thing for us is we never want to pretend like we're getting over this. Um, Ian means too much to me to ever try to get over him. You know what I mean? He's a part of my, my heart and my life and my mind and everybody 
And so, but that's that's the another another long answer for you, Alex. I, mean, I know I'm going on and on, but that's the basis is what the psychedelics have, have done is help me find my path up the mountain. And that's not the only path, but that's the path that I found. And I am super grateful that it did that for me. Mm. And I, yeah, I mean, that's amazing. And, and don't worry, like long answers are, are what we okay. like ultimately. So yeah, keep All on right. coming. <laughs> but I think, right. um, I think some of what you've mentioned there sort of really resonates. And I, I learned a, a new words sort of entering the psychedelic space of kind of ineffable. Um, mm. you, you, there's just no way to truly articulate how the penny drops during some of those experiences but it, but it does right. the best quite powerfully and profoundly as well um mm -hmm. so i can i can yeah i can relate to what you're saying there and i can only imagine that the psychotherapy that you've had is, is kind of in some ways have you found that that to be is part of almost your integration do you discuss any of kind of the psychedelic part within psychotherapy or have they been quite different They've been, they've been separated. So the psychoanalysis, the really deep Freudian psychoanalysis I went through with probably 20, 30 years ago. And um, so at the time I was still Mr. Judgmental anti-drug, right? <laughs> and so lately my therapy has been a, in a different arena and not, not so much integration. But since you went through the book, it's uh, the irony of this whole thing is when I hired this current therapist, whom I love, right? I don't know if she'll see this, but I love her. Um, I told her the very first meeting, I said, have you Googled me? You know what I mean? And it's not like I'm famous, but we're here in the same city, right? So if you search my name, you'll it's like stoned ape. Oh, what is stoned ape? It's psychedelic. So I told her, I said, well, I'm really into psychedelics. And her response was, are you high right now? And I was like, ah. That's not, that's, that's the stigma talking. You know what I mean? It's, it's not, that is not what this is about. And so we had a great candid conversation about the whole thing. And uh, now she's going through the MAPS program to become a certified psychedelic therapist. Wow. You know, and so I'm very proud of her, very happy for her. And I love it when people have an open mind to listen, you know, instead of just judge. But, but no, she, she's, a, she's a different thing. That's a, more of a relationship thing that I'm working on, you know, with my marriage. Okay. And so um, she's working with me on that, not so much, but I do talk about it. You know, I, I send a copy of my book and send it to her because I mentioned her in it, you know, and, um, and the thing about integration, integration is so important because it's just like, it's like anything else. You know, I think one of the a good analogies is like lifting weights. You can go to the gym and, and lift 200 pounds or whatever, but if you don't keep lifting the 200 pounds, then it's not going to do you any good, right? So if I went to that ayahuasca ceremony in La Madre, helped me get rid of my sense of powerlessness. If I just left and said, oh, that was cool, and never thought about it again, then I wouldn't have made it part of my life, which is what integration is. Um, but I'm also a, a, a real uh, contrarian. That's one of the things that I have not gotten rid of in all my journeys. Maybe it's part of my Jungian shadow. So there's, there's things that... Um, that I don't love, that I don't connect with in the psychedelic community. And, uh, you know, Kyle Buller, sorry. But um, it's, uh, I'm not a big, I don't like formal integration. I feel like um, there, there's a, a concern of overriding what actually happened when somebody tries to pull too much from you, whether it's a workbook or a program or a human being or whatever it is. I think working too hard to integrate, even journaling too soon, right? Everybody says, you know, journal, journal, journal. And sometimes I think even journaling too soon um, or too deep too soon, right? It's okay to say kind of on the surface what happened. You know, I drank the medicine, I saw this, I went out back on the hammock and I looked up at the stars, you know, that kind of surface level stuff. Yeah, get it out there so you don't forget. But trying to figure out what happened too soon, I think can, can override it. But once that lesson does come to the surface, like mine have, right? I have some very big lessons, then, then I won't write those down. I'll say, here's what I remember. Here's what I think occurred. Um, and then you got to practice it. You know, it's just something that you just had, one has to say. I had to say, you know, because the La Madre and the Ayahuasca, it's not like 
somebody just walked up to me and said, Hey, Stuart, you're not powerless. You know what I mean? It's more powerful than that because you're, you're under the influence of this medicine. You're maybe in a different realm. You know what I mean? You're maybe in a different reality even. And this lesson, it, she doesn't come to me and say, you're not powerless. She builds this little thing and says, get rid of this and doesn't even tell me, you know what I mean? And so eventually the integration process is the lesson kind of forms. And once the lesson forms, then I can say, oh my gosh, I, this is what I just learned. And then got to put that into practice, you know? So understanding that I was, that I was feeling unworthy and suicidal myself, knowing that is a huge help for me. Knowing the powerlessness is a huge help. Now there's some things like the peyote turned me into a vegetarian that I didn't even have to integrate. You know what I mean? I didn't have to think about it. It just made meat disgusting. And so now I can't eat it. I wish I could, because there's sometimes I still crave it, but I just can't put meat into my mouth anymore. Wow. And so that wasn't something I had to work on. That was something that just changed. But yeah, the integration process, I think it's very important. So any, anybody who's going through this, even though I don't love integration coaches, uh, I've got a good friend here in town who's an integration coach. Um, I think you should have one. Anybody listening, you know what I mean? Is I, I don't do it. So the hypocrite in me is like, yeah, I don't do it because I don't want to overwrite all my lessons, but you should because, <laughs> yeah, they will, especially if you're new, you know, they'll, they'll help you prepare. So all that research that I did, you don't have to do that alone. If you find a good integration coach, you know, he or she will take you through and say, okay, set, setting, dose, understand this, what, what's your intention, what's your purpose, and really get you aligned with, on your journey, right? And then when you go have your journey, however you do it, you come back to them and, and they'll help you. A good one, I think, will help you pull that stuff out, um, make it usable without overriding it, but... I just worry too much about it. So I just do it on my own. Yeah. yeah. And it's, I, I agree. I think there's, there's a real fine balance to be had. I think it's really easy to have these experiences and actually it becomes just an experience or even a story that, you know, we're kind of continually telling people. Um, and I think actually being able to sit there, whether it is with a journal later on or however it may be, to change some of those daily habits, for example, some of those behaviors or automated responses, I think that's really where most of the magic ultimately is going to happen anyway. Um, yeah. And so I can look back and think of my, my very first psychedelic experience. And it probably took me six months before I started actually acting upon some of the things that came up there. So I, I've shared it mm. with um, I spent what felt like at least an hour just staring at this massive pink octopus in a room. I felt like a fly on a wall. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's almost common sense, the idea that, oh, well, octopus stands for multitasking. And I was mm. asking at the time, and, and I, I feel that there was just a connection there. And really what happened in that entire ceremony was, um, I think one of the key messages was, you're tired, you're doing way too much. We're not going to actually give you much during this ceremony. You're just going to lie here. Um, mm. Have some profound experiences, but nothing like what you can read or hear about or ones that I've had since where I've had more space to, to be able to go there, I guess, ultimately. Um, but yeah, it took me a very long time to kind of actually start making some actual changes in my life as a result of the experience that I had. Mm. Um, because, you know, I've spoken to a few friends about this and sometimes it's just, you know, it's fun or it can be fun. So, you know, some of those experiences, especially if you've got set and setting in place, um, you know, there is that element to it, I think, sometimes where people just uh -huh. enjoy the experience that psilocybin or ayahuasca can provide. But obviously that does depend on all of the context ultimately as well. Yeah, some people have a great time and some people have a rotten time. Yeah. And it's still, it's still important to them, you know, the rotten time. But yeah, it's, it's, I've sat in ayahuasca circles and people are laughing, people are crying. You know, I think, I don't know if I mentioned the book, but at one point I looked over and this woman in the circle sounded like she's having the best orgasm of her life. You know what I mean? And people are throwing up. There are people sitting at the altar in the fetal position, you know, and so it's it, whatever you've got that needs to be pulled out of you, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm curious, I mean, are you happy to share a little bit more about sort of the, the giving up of meat? What, was there like a, 
Was there an specific yeah. experience in that ceremony? Or was it kind of more just like random? It was just random. <laughs> and the, the thing about peyote, um, and I'm very lucky, we have a, a legal peyote church, pe the Peyote Way Church here in Arizona. So we have a place to go and do a spirit walk. And it's a solitary experience where you go out into the desert with these beautiful human beings out there and they show you the peyote and the, the greenhouses and the land and you really connect and you, you're there on this on site for 24 hours fasting and meditating before anything even begins. So you're really grounded. You know, your set and setting are really just perfectly molded. And then they give you the tea and you take the tea, you go out to your solitary space all by yourself. Right. So you're not in a ceremony, you're just all by yourself. And you sip on this terrible tea for about six hours. Right. I usually make it four or five hours before I throw up and my body just rejects it and can't take any more of it. And then um, they don't like the word subtle. Right. In fact, one time, you know, Annie got kind of mad at me because I said the word subtle. It, and it's, it's not uh, it's only subtle because if you compare it to the amazing experience of ayahuasca or a DMT trip or even mushrooms or LSD. It's not like that. It's very, it's very um, subtle, you know, but I know things are going on because my consciousness is completely clear. It's like, I'm, it's like I'm meditating. I will get maybe a little bit of, of little visions just, but it's just like, you know, the goal of meditation is to calm your mind and peyote has a way of completely calming my mind. So it just like, there are no random thoughts just spitting out of my brain. It's just like pure calmness. So just me, the star, the coyotes. And so just sitting out there in the desert doing all this, um, packed up, drove home. And then I was just like, yeah, meat sounds kind of gross right now. And so I said, I'm just going to give up meat. And I said, I'm going to start with beef, I think. I said, I'm just going to give up beef. I'll still have pork and chicken. And then I went out and I got something to eat. And I was like, nope, this is gross too. And I said, okay, I'm just going to eat fish. And then I went out and got a fish sandwich or whatever. I was like, nope, this is gross too. And then I just was like, okay, I can't. Now there's some exceptions. For some reason I can eat an oyster and I can eat a chicken heart, right? Or a, a turkey heart. Whoa. So I can eat those. I haven't tried any other innards, but yeah, it's just, uh, so this could all change in any minute because it changed on a whim. Yeah. So maybe at some point, you know, come through and go, blam, I'm, I'm back to eating meat. But yeah, there was no lesson. You know, I didn't get some scary vision of eating some animal and hurting it or, and I'm not doing this for moral reasons or ethical reasons. I literally just came out of the desert and, and the thought of eating another animal's muscles was gross. And so I just can't, I just can't do it. Wow. Yeah. And it really, it really, uh, I don't say it saved my life, um, but it added years to my life. I'm sure, you know, my, my, my skin has gotten better. I've lost a lot of weight. I feel better, you know? And so I think the health side of it, you know, they're probably, cause I was overeating meat, you know, I was eating meat at an unhealthy level, like, like most Americans, frankly. And so um, it probably was just the, the medicine helping my, my subconscious recognize it, what it needed to recognize was like, man, you're overdoing this you need to cut back on this, you know? And so it just, it flips some switch internally so that I wouldn't eat meat anymore. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. And it's happened to others. I've had other people come up to me and say, same thing happened to me, man. I, I did LSD and now I can't eat meat. I did LSD and I can't drink alcohol, you know, and just certain things happen where it's like, kind of like, we know we need to make a change in our lives, but we don't necessarily have the intellectual ability the willpower ability to make the change. So under the influence of these medicines, our brain is able to somehow uh, make that change itself. Yeah, and obviously in, the, in your book, you mentioned kind of the default mode network and which has been getting a lot of attention in the research as I guess one of the mechanisms by which psychedelics work. Um, so if, can you, if our listeners aren't necessarily aware of, of kind of that from a, a fundamental perspective, are you happy just to kind of share that piece? Yeah, and there are some studies out there. I think uh, Robin Carhart Harris there, there in the UK, you know, has done some great studies on this. But, and, and I don't know that anything is definitive, you know, at this point, but the default mode network appears to be um, kind of a, the network that combines everything in the brain that kind of syncs everything all up together 
and helps us be conscious. And so when, when that default mode network is quieted down, then the brain almost goes back into a state of like when we were an infant and all the stuff starts lighting up in our brain again. And that enables us to create new pathways and new understandings. And, you know, there's neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, right? And neuroplasticity is being able to create new pathways between our neurons and our brain. And so when you quiet down the default mode network or, you know, open up your brain to all these different pathways. So like a child, an infant learns, like if you take a, a newborn and show him or her an apple, their brain just goes, it's like, wow, wow, what is this new thing you're showing me? It's red. And so the, that all happens. And then, then you give them applesauce, right? They're like, oh, and then you show them a picture of an apple in a book, you know, letter A, apple, and apple pie, you know, and apple fritter, apple computers, and all this stuff. And their, their brain stops firing off everything, and it's called pairing. It pairs it down and builds these maybe called schema. So you show somebody an, an apple, an adult, and show me or you an apple. Um, our brain goes, builds this schema inside of our brain and says, okay, I know exactly what that is. I know everything around it. And we also have a reaction, like an emotional, phenomenal reaction to this apple. And so like we do with a black widow or a rattlesnake, right? We have an emotional, phenomenal reaction to it. And so I think that the psychedelics, when they quiet quiet down the, the control mechanisms, allow the brain to start firing back like when I was a kid and we can build new pathways and new understandings and maybe maybe even open up, a, you know, ability to identify uh, past trauma, you know, and past events in life and, and memories. And it just, it just kind of gives us the ability to, to use our brain in, in a new and different way that it might, that might uncover some very important things for us. Yeah, it's really fast. That's my take. I would ask Dr. Her Carter Harris, you know, but um, that's, that's, that's my take on, on some of the things that I've studied. Yeah. Brilliant. I think, you know, from a, a personal experience, certainly sort of low to moderate doses, the, the clarity afterwards, it really feels like the brain has been defragged, you know, things have been filed, yes. God has been pruned and I've just never really experienced anything like that ultimately. Um, and for someone who spends so much time in their head to this day, uh, it's nice just to, to feel. Yeah. Give yourself a reset. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those low doses. And I'm at a point now, I don't know what or why, or, you know, cause the thing with psychedelics is they, they are like anti tolerant or whatever. So if I take uh, a full dose of mushrooms today, I can't take another one tomorrow. Right. It's, it's probably seven to 10 to 14 days before I could do another one, which I don't do. It's usually for me, uh, two or three months in between. So, but they're like anti-addictive, you know, be, because of that. Um, but I've gotten to a point where a very low dose of this stuff fires me up, you know what I mean? And I can really get a lot of insight and have an amazing journey with, you know, maybe the equivalent of one and a half grams of, of mushrooms instead of three and a half grams, you know, or the heroic five grams, you know, I, one and a half now will really get me there. So yeah, there's, there's something to be said for, for the low doses and what they can do. And, and you're right, that, that reset, um, boy, that feels good. You know what I mean? It's not like feels good like heroin. It just like, it just feels good. Like, yeah, I needed that, like a good jog, you know, or a workout or a day out on the farm, you know, you just feel like, okay, that felt really good. I needed that physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And so it's, it is a good reset. Mm, yeah. And do, have you found, you know, with your, with your journey with psychedelics, that, you know, you've mentioned there that a lower dose seems, you seem to be able to, to have that sort of experience now that maybe you weren't previously. Do you find that it's kind of improved with time as you've kind of peeled back the layers of the onion, so to speak, that as a result of doing that, there's more, it's almost like you become more sensitive or you become more open to the experience and as a result maybe need less or have you found anything like that at all yeah that's i guess that's uh that's one of my hypotheses on this because in the early days i had a lot of fear you know like i mentioned is, is i would i would go on my journey whatever it was and i would feel fear and i don't feel fear anymore because i know what's going on right and so i feel better also 
there is this, um, the mindset piece of it. It's not just being ready, but it's also being able to open one's mind to the journey, to, to kind of open to facilitating what's about to happen. And I think I mentioned this in the book, but I used to go into journeys and I would say to myself, uh, just let go, right? I learned that from somebody on Reddit, you know, or somewhere that said, hey, just let go. Don't, don't try to have this intention. Don't try to force anything, just let go, which sounded great. And so that's what I did. I literally would write that down on a piece of paper and put it down in front of me. It's just like, just let go, just let go. And so a friend of mine explained to me that just letting go, just let go is an expectation and builds attachment and maybe a desire to let go, right? It's like, okay, my journey depends on me being able to let go. And so now I have this attachment and this desire and this expectation. And I didn't realize I had dumped all that stuff on myself. And so she said, just say, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. And going into a journey and just saying, I don't know is uh is freeing you know it's just like okay i, I don't know what's going to happen and so i'm all yours you know let, let's go and since then i slide into the journey as i think a little faster a little more open and so yeah through time uh knowing that i don't have to be afraid of what's about to happen that um that i my my brain can can open up in a way in a new way without setting any kind of expectations or limiting it. I think that does, that does help. And the truth is I'm stupid. So the reason that I found out that a low dose is good is I miscalculated in doing some measurements one time. And I thought I was doing around four because four to 4.2 has always kind of been my, my favorite dosage. And I had just messed up. You know, because I like to start my journey like at four, four thirty in the morning because I'm a morning person. I don't want to be up all night. And I just I guess I was tired and I, I screwed the whole thing up and had the most amazing journey. I mean, it was just incredible. And the next the next day, I was sitting there running over things in my head and I was like, you dummy. That was about maybe one point five to one point seven grams. That wasn't four or four point two. You know, you, you, you messed up your math. And I was like, Wow. And so then you wonder, was there a placebo effect, you know, that I went into with this and my brain just said, oh, we have four, let's go. Right. But since then, that one and a half equivalent is, has been uh, just incredible. Hmm. Right. So I don't know. I don't know if that if just conditioning, you know, whatever it is. But um, yeah, I, I, I still will do a larger dose, you know, on occasion just to really dig around. Yeah. But I find that 1.5 to 1.7 is a really great sweet spot. Great. I mean, that's so interesting what you talk about in regards to like the words. And, you know, I do an, a lot of breath work. I'm training to be a transmitter mm. work practitioner at the nice. moment. And, nice. um, you know, so we use an intention going into the breath ceremony, for example. And for a long time, I, I had the intention of I'm just going to surrender. You know, I just want to surrender to whatever comes right. up. And it, it never really led to anything... Um, really profound to, at that point in time. So I decided I'm just going to change the intention. And I think I went into a, a, a breath session with the intention of, I'm going to kind of accept, I'm going to accept what comes up. And it felt very different energetically. Surrender for me feels like something's going that way, whereas accepting is like I'm allowing things in and I'm going to experience. Yeah. Um, and it just led to... Hmm the most profound breath session I've had to this day. Um, and it shows you like the power of these words that we use for our intentions, I think. Um, yeah. 100% relate to what you were saying there. Yeah, I love it. I, I can see, I feel very similar to what you're saying as to what I experienced. The difference between just let go and I don't know. It feels very analogous to um, accepting you know, you're, cause you're kind of, instead of surrendering, you know, here's the white flag. I surrendered. There's like so many things. So just accept it in there. That feels good. That's good. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ponder that and maybe integrate that into my stuff. Nice. Yeah. I think um, I'll never forget that. Just the most incredible experience ultimately. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it, nice. it's you know, the importance of, of having maybe something like an integration coach, if it, especially if it's your first time, just to 
to hear those kind of experiences and those little subtle changes that can make all the difference ultimately. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, is there anything else that you, you you would like to kind of share with our listeners, Stuart? Anything that we've we've missed out so far? Um, I guess the only thing would be the the bottom line to all of this, in my opinion, my feeling. The reason I the reason I'm doing all of this is to break the stigmas, like we talked about in the very beginning, is to break the stigmas around talking about uh, grief and mental health and suicide and psychedelics because that stigma is what keeps people from getting help, right? So somebody who's feeling suicidal tends to not get help because they don't want to be stigmatized. They don't want people at work thinking that they're weak. They don't want to worry about getting institutionalized against their will. They don't want to worry about healthcare costs. And and there are so many things that will play into somebody's mind that are really all wrapped around stigma, which they don't have if they break their leg, right? They never think, oh, I'm weak. My bones are weaker than everybody else's. I'm going to sit at home and and let my leg rot off, right? They, They go to the hospital and they get their leg fixed. And that's the way it should be for everything, right? So I think that you're doing great work here and allowing people to talk about this stuff. And I just would say to anybody out there, just please talk. You know, Alex and I have talked about grief and mental health and psychedelics. And I just hope that other people will openly talk about all of these things because when we talk, then people will get help. And if, if they get help, then maybe they won't die. So that's, that's to me, that's the bottom line is to let's all talk about this stuff. Yeah, definitely. I think that's it, you know, the communication for me has like been a big thing of my journey over the last sort of three, four years, I think. It's just whether that's with our partners, loved ones, colleagues, friends, whoever it is, um, we are relational beings and we depend on that kind of ability to communicate. Um, so I couldn't agree more. Um, and if people are interested to learn more, Stuart, where, where do you hang out? Where can people find your work, your content, etc.? Probably the central place is uh, stonedapecomedy.com, um, in which, by the way, you know, Dennis and Terrence McKenna came up with that theory of stoned ape, and I've interviewed uh, Dennis McKenna twice now, and he's okay with it, so I'm not ripping anything off, but I, I definitely give him and his brother credit for that theory, the stoned ape theory, um, but I use that because I feel like a personal stoned ape that I have evolved because of the use of psychedelics. So that's where that comes from. But Stoned Ape Comedy, um, you'll find my book there. You'll find the Stoned Ape Show there, uh, links to my my Facebook pages and all that kind of stuff. So that's probably the the one. And you mentioned connecting with me. Um, I am happy to connect with anybody. And I have people who do reach out to me asking questions. And um, I'm certainly never going to sell you drugs or send you drugs or, you know, I'm not going to help you do anything illegal. Mm -hmm. I always say stay safe, stay legal with everything you're doing. Um, but if you have questions about grief, about mental health, about your own psychedelic journey, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to talk to anybody. Brilliant. And I'll, uh, I'll, sh- I'll share all of those links in the show notes as well. So people have easy access. Thank you, Alex. Stuart, thank you so much. I could, I could speak with you all day really about these topics. I think they're, they're incredibly important. They're close to my heart, certainly. And as you say, really important to kind of get that message out there. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and and all the great work you're doing. So thank you, Alex. Thank you.